Alright, my name is Allison Cooley, and I'm going to talk about some of the biochemical tests that can be used to identify and distinguish between different types of microorganisms in a sample. So first off, I'll give a little bit of an explanation about the difference between selective media, differential media, and a nutrient growth media. So most of these media can all be used for isolation, but that just depends on what type of organism is in question. The auger substance used in solid media is relatively unre unreactive and can't be metabolized by most bacteria. So it's pretty inert in the media and it's great for holding on to nutrients and allowing microorganisms to grow. And this is exactly the process in a nutrient or growth media. All it really does is supplies nutrients or food needed for microorganisms to grow. Most types of microorganisms will grow in this media, but if you're just wanting to grow one or a few types of microorganisms, you need to select against what you don't want. You want a selective media. This is used to select for only the bacteria in question. This is going to use, this type of media is going to use substances that inhibit what is not needed, that slow the growth of what you don't want. So for an example, I have a picture at the bottom of the slide. It's called MSA auger. I'll explain more about how that works later. But basically, it uses some high salt concentrations to inhibit the growth of organisms that can't tolerate that. So if you're also wanting to tell the difference between two or more microorganisms, you can use a differential medium. And a medium that is strictly differential is not going to inhibit unnecessary microbes, but it's going to let you tell the difference between two or more different kinds. So it'll differentiate them based on their fermentation products, normally acids, or some other characteristic like how they move or if they produce gas. And many of the media used to, discern, to observe and identify bacteria are going to be selective and differential. So I'll go ahead and start and talk about a few examples of differential and selective media. First off, we've got the mannitol salt auger, which I just mentioned. It's called MSA. Again, it's both selective and differential. It is selective because it has a very high salt concentration. I believe it's about 7%. And it's going to inhibit the growth of most types of gram-positive and gram-negative, because most bacteria simply cannot handle this high salt concentration. So it, it's going to select for the organisms that can grow, which includes the Staphylococcus species. This, um, it, this auger is going to select for Staphylococcus species. Most other organisms, if they can grow, they're only going to grow very weakly. So mainly you're just going to have Staphylococcus on the plate. This auger is also used to differentiate between staph Staphylococcus aureus and Staphylococcus epidermidis with the sugar mannitol. So Staph aureus can ferment mannitol and it turns a pH indicator called phenol red to a yellow color due to the acidic end products. But most of your non-pathogenic strep, like Staph epidermidis, are not going to ferment mannitol. So they can grow, but they're just going to stay red in color on the plate, which is the same color as the auger. Next up, we've got the McConkie auger, or MAC. It's a very good differential and selective medium for enterics or coliforms. And these are bacteria that exist in the intestines of plenty of animals. They're members of Enterio, Enterobacteriaceae, and again, they live in the intestines of animals. The on this auger, you've got the selective agents, which are bile salts and crystal violet. Those are going to inhibit most of your gram-positive organisms. You're only looking at gram-negatives on this auger. And this auger differentiates by using lactose carbohydrate and a pH indicator called neutral red. Your lactose fermenters like Escherichia coli and Klebsiella pneumoniae are going to produce acidic end products when they ferment lactose, and they're going to appear varying shades of red or pink around the colonies. You can see that at the bottom right, you see the pinkish colonies. And your non-lactose fermenters are going to be colorless, and you might have even some of the bile salts that surround the colonies as a precipitate. 
And we've got Eosin Methylene Blue Auger EMB. It's very similar to McConkie Auger in function. You, it differentiates between lactose fermenters, non-lactose fermenters, and very rapid lactose fermenters, which is something that MAC doesn't do. So this one's very useful for looking at Escherichia coli because it is a very la rapid lactose fermenter, and it's going to have a metallic green sheen. The um, lactose positive organisms are going to appear blue-black due to the ESMY and methylene blue pH indicator dyes. And if it's non-fermenter, again, it's going to be colorless. And again, this auger is very useful for identifying your E. coli. Next, we have a Salmonella Shigella auger, or SS. It's, this one is going to inhibit coliforms because you're mainly looking at just your Salmonella and Shigella. It differentiates between hydrogen sulfide gas producers and non-producers. It's not as recommended for Shigella just because the brilliant green dye might inhibit some types of Shigella and cause them to grow slower, but the bile salts and brilliant green and sodium citrate um, all work together to inhibit gram-positive organisms and coliforms. Any lactose fermenters that will grow on this auger are going to be pink to red due to the neutral red indicator. And um, your non-fermenters, again, are going to be colorless, like most instances. And um, another scenario is added here. If an organism can produce hydrogen sulfide gas, it's going to have a black center. And this is going to be many of your Salmonella and Proteus species, and they actually may look similar on this auger. And the hydrogen sulfide gas is produced when the organism reduces sulfate present in the auger while oxidizing an organic compound. So it produces that black precipitate, which you can see in the bottom in the middle picture. Next we've got Hectamin and Teric auger which utilizes three types of carbohydrates, which are lactose, sucrose, and salicin. Those are the carbohydrate sources present. So it's going to differentiate between any organism that can ferment either of those carbohydrates and the ones that can't ferment it. Also, it will differentiate between hydrogen sulfide gas producers and non-producers. It also selects against gram-positives, using bile salts and the dyes acid fusion and thymol blue. Um, ferric ammonium citrate provides a source of iron to allow hydrogen sulfide gas production from sodium thiosulfate. When the hydrogen sulfide gas is produced, it needs iron to react with the sulfate, and that's what produces the gas. The ferric ammonium citrate also reacts with hydrogen sulfide to form a black precipitate which you can see in the bottom, that salmonella on the right has, that, has those black centers, and that's very typical, salmonella, and also proteus. These can look similar on this auger as well, so it can be a little difficult to differentiate those two. Any enterics that ferment at least one of the carbohydrates are going to produce yellow to salmon-colored colonies, and non-fermenters will have blue or green colonies. And, of course, your hydrogen sulfide gas producers are going to have black centers. And proteus can sometimes even be yellow to salmon color. It just depends. So this wouldn't be great for determining if you've got proteus or not, but it's great for determining whether you've got salmonella or hydrogen sulfide gas producers. Okay. Next auger is your Brilliant Green auger. It's highly selective for Salmonella, except it will inhibit the growth, actually, of Salmonella typhi and Salmonella paratyphi. The Brilliant Green dye inhibits gram-positive and most gram-negative bacilli. And the, there's two carbohydrate sources in this auger. They are the lactose, lactose and sucrose, and phenol red is used as a pH indicator. And it turns the auger yellow to yellow-green if there's lactose fermenting 
and or sucrose ferments in colonies present. Non-fermenters, which include Salmonella or Proteus, are going to be white, pink to red, and most of them are going to be surrounded by red zones in the medium, which can be seen on the left, and those lactose, ferment, lactose or sucrose fermenters are seen on the right. Okay, so that was um, pretty much all the auger used in the lab to determine whether um, these are all, those augers that I just previously mentioned are pretty important in determining whether an organism is commensal or non-harmful or if it is pathogenic. Because many pathogenic organisms are non-lactose fermenters. Okay, now we'll move on to some biochemical tests other than auger plates. We've got first up the methyl red and Vogue's Prescara tests. These tests are part of the IMVIC tests, which are very important for determining pathogenicity and other characteristics of microorganisms. So these are used to differentiate between two possible pathways of glucose fermentation in microorganisms. The first pathway used is called a mixed acid fermentation pathway. This produces several types of acids um, when glucose is being fermented by the microorganism. And all these acids combined together is going to re result in a really low pH, around 4.4. And a pH indicator called methyl red can confirm this. The second type of glucose fermentation pathway produces 2,3-butane diol rather than the acids. Acetylmethyl carbonyl is a precursor to the end product and is used for testing in the Vogue's Prescara test. So, um, speaking of the methyl red test, if you've got a broth culture and you want to determine whether it uses that first pathway, the mixed acid fermentation pathway, you can use methyl red pH indicator. So, once you've got the, the glucose in your sample, then um, and it's incubated, your, sim your organism will start fermenting it and you can, um, after incubation, test to see if it is this first pathway. So methyl red's added and if it turns red, then we know that the pH is below 4.4 and if it's yellow, that means it's above 6.0. And with the Vogue's Prescara test, this can be performed a test for the second type of glucose fermentation I mentioned. And again, that the, what it's testing for is the precursor to 2,3-butane diol, and that's called acetylmethylcarbonyl, or AMC. And it can be tested for um, using the VP test. There are two reagents that are added to the culture broth after incubation, and it's shaken vigorously. It's then set aside for 10 to 15 minutes. And if the culture is positive for the AMC, it's going to turn brownish red to a pinkish color, which you can see that brownish red color down at the bottom on the right, that positive Vogue's Prescara test. A negative test is just going to be like brownish green to yellow. And one thing to remember is since these tests are looking at different pathways that bacteria can use, normally a culture is only going to be positive for one test. Normally it can't be positive for both although that's not always true. Next up we have a citrate utilization test. And this test is used to determine whether a microorganism can use citrate as its only source of carbon. So since we're trying to see if it only uses citrate, the um, media needs to not have any proteins or carbohydrates in it. It doesn't need to have anything else that the bacteria could use. And that's to control for if we see it using citrate, we need to make sure that citrate's the only thing that it's using. This is especially useful if you, if you know that your sample is in the family Enterobacteriaceae. And it works by if the organism uses citrate as its only carbon source, the citrase enzyme is going to break down citrate into oxaloacetic acid. This acid is broken down into pyruvic acid and carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide produce, um, reacts with 
substances in the Simmons citrate auger, which is the auger used for this test. When it reacts with these substances in the auger, it produces an alkaline pH that turns bromphenol blue from green to blue. You can see this in this picture. On the left, it's visibly a green color, and that's a negative test. On the right is a positive test. It's a very bright, dark, really pretty blue color. And Shigella dysentery is a negative example. Proteus mirabilis is a positive example for citrate utilization. Next test we've got is called urea hydrolysis. This is one way you actually can distinguish proteus from salmonella. Like I mentioned before, they're sometimes really hard to differentiate. And so proteus hydrolyzes urea very rapidly, while salmonella doesn't hydrolyze it at all. So this test works by using Christensen's urea auger, and it can test for weakly positive or strong positive urea hydrolysis. A few other Enterobacteriaceae will hydrolyze urea as well, and often very weakly. But if an organism does hydrolyze urea, it releases ammonia as a product. Ammonia reacts with CO2, and it produces ammonium carbonate. A phenol red indicator changes the medium from bright red pink or to bright red pink when you have this alkaline pH. So you can see at the bottom there's that really bright pink color that indicates a positive test for urease when urease is the uh, enzyme that helps with urea hydrolysis. And on the left you have the urease negative test. And a weekly positive result it's going to be pinkish red, mainly just on the slant, and uh, the strongly red positive result is going to be pink red throughout the slant and the butt. Next test I've got to talk about is sulfur This test um, differentiates microorganisms using three different criteria, and the first criteria is sulfur reduction. I've talked about this before. It, um, the sodium thiosulfate and an iron source in the auger are used to determine H2S production, produces a black color in the medium, and Proteus mirabilis is one of those organisms that will produce hydrogen sulfide gas that will move throughout the medium. The next criteria it differentiates is um, whether the bacteria can convert tryptophan into indole. So indole reacts with a reagent in the auger to produce a red color. You see that at the bottom of the screen, in the right picture, letter A has a red substance at the top, and that is going to indicate an indole positive result. An example of that is going to be Escherichia coli. It's indole positive. The third criteria that the SIM test uh, tests for is motility. So the the medium has sort of this semi-solid consistency and it, if the microorganism is modal it'll allow it to move around and swim out from where it was inoculated into the medium. So at the bottom um, on the left picture in the middle there's a long line going from the top to the bottom of the tube. In that test you can see that the bacteria didn't move much they pretty much just stayed where they were inoculated with the, with the needle and but to the, directly to the right of that, the medium is completely red, so you can see that the bacteria actually moved from where it was originally inoculated, and the motility test to be positive. And an example of that is going to be salmonella. So next up, we've got starch hydrolysis. This is a test for differentiating um, bacteria that can hydrolyze starch and bacteria that can't. This is pretty useful for um, differentiating Clostridium and Bacillus. It's going to identify bacteria that break down starch. These bacteria, when they break down starch, they produce enzymes called alpha amylase and oligo-1,6-glucosidase. And they produce these to help break down the starch just because they can't really bring in the starch just because it's a large molecule. They have a hard time bringing it in the cell wall. So they break down the starch into smaller humans. And iodine is added to the medium to mix with the starch, so it's easier to visualize. 
the results of this test. The iodine and starch react to form a brown color, and if an organism can hydrolyze starch, it's gonna, there's going to be a clear zone inside the medium. So at the bottom you can see how one does not hydrolyze starch, and that would be an example of maybe Bacillus cereus, which does not hydrolyze starch. And on the right, you have a sample of Bacillus subtilis, which does hydrolyze starch and produces that zone of clearing. So next is uh, Kligler's iron auger. And this differentiates on two criteria, a microorganism's ability to ferment glucose and or lactose, and hydrogen sulfide gas production. Um, this test is interesting because your non-lactose fermenters are often pathogens, like I said before. So this is pretty useful for determining if it is a pathogen or not. So the, um, the media only has a small amount of glucose, about 0.1%, and it's got about 1% of lactose, which is a lot comparatively. So the glucose-only fermenters are going to quickly exhaust the supply of glucose, and the acidic products of glucose fermentation are going to turn the entire um, Kia tube yellow with the, due to the phenol red indicator. And this is within the first few hours of incubation. You're going to see an entire tube yellow. But if the organism can also ferment lactose, it's going gonna, it's gonna to do just that. It's going to continue to produce your acidic the acidic products from fermentation of lactose, and the media is going to stay yellow. And this is um, one of those really time-sensitive tests, so you can't really look at it past about 24 hours because the um, glucose may, I mean, the fermenter may use up all the glucose and the lactose and start using other things that, that exist in the auger. So you have to look at it in about 18 to 24 hours. And if gas is produced by either glucose or lactose fermentators, then you're going to see little cracks in the media. And you might even see the media move up and have um, an empty space at the bottom where the gas will be. Um, your second scenario for this test can be if the organism doesn't, cannot use lactose but can use glucose, then it'll be forced to use proteins and amino acids in the medium once it's used up all the glucose in the tube. And this is going to create MH3 and make the media alkaline. This is going to turn phenol red to a red color. The butt of the tube takes longer to turn yellow from the glucose fermentation. So you can see at the bottom if you have just a glucose fermentator, which is the second from the left, you're going to have yellow in the butt, but red in the slant. And the red is due to the phenol red turning red once when it makes the, the alkaline byproducts. So, in the again, in the 24-hour time period, glucose-only fermenters will have a yellow butt with a red slant. The third scenario is if the organism can't use either glucose or lactose, which is very rare. Normally, um... Most bacteria can use at least glucose, but if it can't use either glucose or lactose, it's only going to use the amino acids or proteins that are present in the auger. And you can see this, the first picture at the bottom, non-glucose and non-lactose fermenter. It's going to be red throughout the medium, normally a deep red color. And another thing you can check for is hydrogen sulfide gas production, which is observed when um, the iron in the Kligler's iron auger reacts with sulfur released from the amino acids. And a dark color in the butt of the tube is a positive result. This process is almost exclusively anaerobic, which is why it's in the butt of the tube. And um, this will sometimes cover up the color of the butt of the tube, which then it will be hard to tell whether it's a glucose or lactose fermenter. But luckily, um, there's always an acidic condition in the butt if you have hydrogen sulfide gas production. So that tells you that the color is yellow in the butt even if you can't see it. My next test is catalase. 
And this is a pretty simple test, very easy to do. This um, test looks for if an organism has catalase present. And the catalase helps an organism break down hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen gas. So normally hydrogen peroxide is going to kill microorganisms because they just can't handle it. Um, but the catalase helps them to helps to protect them from it. The oxygen gas bubbles can be detected bubbling out of the sample if you add a drop of hydrogen peroxide to the sample. And this is a pretty simple test to de determine the difference between staph and strep. Your staphylococcus are going to be positive for catalase test and streptococcus are going to be negative. And my final test is nitrate reduction test. This is used to determine if an organism can reduce nitrate to nitrite or if it can reduce nitrate all the way down to gaseous nitrogen compounds. And the gaseous nitrogen compounds actually can't be tested for chemically, so, but you can test for whether the sample has nitrate or nitrite in it. So if you have a culture broth, the first step to do with this test is to test for nitrite present in the sample. And you do this using nitrate reagent 1 and nitrate reagent 2. They're both added to the culture broth. And if you have nitrate in your broth, it's going to react with those two reagents and turn red. And this will indicate a positive result for nitrite. And if it does turn red, then there's no more testing needed because you know that nitrate has been reduced to nitrite. Um, but if you... If the color, I mean, if the broth remains the same color as it was before the reagents were added, then you need to do a subsequent test. The next test um, tests for if the nitrate was reduced all the way down to gaseous products. And in this test, you're going to add a little bit of zinc dust to the test tube for, to the test tube. And this test to see if nitrate was reduced all the way to the gaseous products. And the zinc converts any nitrate in the tube to nitrite. And the nitrite will then react with those reagents that it didn't react with before. And it'll turn red, indicating a negative result. So if it turns red, you know that there was nitrate in your sample, indicating that it didn't, it wasn't reduced at all. You just, your organism was not able to reduce nitrate to nitrite or to the gaseous products. But after if after adding zinc dust, if no if you don't observe a color change, then there's no nitrate present. And that means that the um, nitrate was reduced all the way down to the gaseous products. And then you know that your organism can reduce nitrate completely. And that was the last of the tests I needed to explain. Thank you for listening.